I had a daughter in 1982 who died at six weeks to SIDS. And for 38 years, I walked this planet believing that that was gonna be the hardest thing I would ever have to go through. And about four months into the riots, I heard myself say out loud for the very first time that the last four months of my life have, been, have proven to be harder than the first four months after she died. I'm 63 years old, I'm disabled. I live downtown Portland in Section 8 housing. I've lived downtown for eight years. I loved everything that Portland had to offer. The city is going through what I would define as a collapse, where it's collapsing from crime, from homelessness, through the destruction of the city itself, through the inability of the government to actually take serious actions to address it. Our business, along with many businesses around us, were attacked. Windows smashed, vandalism, theft. We incurred well over $60,000 in damages. The businesses around us had to board up. We had to board up. It was really the only protection that we were able to get to protect ourselves against Antifa. In the last couple of years, I've watched my city go from a beautiful, thriving city to a city that's become one of the most violent places I've ever lived in. It's no longer a place that I want to be. We only got to this point because the city and citizens supported the actions that were actually going on. And I think now we're starting to see where people are like, you know, Maybe this wasn't such a good idea. People now that, you know, once, you know, condoned what was happening now stand up and say, I may have voted for Joanne Hardesty, but I didn't vote for this, for what the cost is to the city. I didn't vote to watch the crime go up, the homicides go up. I didn't vote for that. I've lived in Portland since 2007, and I moved here because it was friendly and community-oriented. I was proud to be in a city that valued taking care of the environment and that seemingly promoted liberalism. Portland was a popular destination for tourists, and many people wanted to move here. It was even memorialized in a well-known TV show that was filmed locally. In 2009, I started my film career here and found a great group of like-minded friends. At least I thought we were like-minded, but as the protests and the riots of 2020 kicked off, I discovered I was one of the few people willing to call out the destruction and violence for what it was. I started losing friends and learned that some people in the film industry think of me as a bigot. Naturally, I found myself, for the first time in 13 years, wanting to move out of this once great city. So much of what made Portland great, the friendliness, its community-oriented nature, led people's compassion and even their sense of morality to be hijacked by woke activists with radical agendas. Many voted for politicians and policies because of the social justice rhetoric they used, and this has led Portland into a steep decline. Words like equity, diversity, and inclusion are thrown around constantly without people really knowing what these ideas actually mean. And many residents here went along with the idea of defunding the police because they thought social workers could take over a lot of the responsibilities of the police force. Some of my progressive friends even justified burning down small businesses in the name of racial justice. The whole BLM movement kind of got co-opted by Antifa and people in Black Bloc, and it was more used as an opportunity to push other agendas versus what most of us were outraged about. And that's what happened to George Floyd. And it, it's an unfortunate situation, but it doesn't mean that we need to tear down the fabric of our country, our city, and the cause, death and destruction. 
I believe the city of Portland exploited George Floyd and COVID-19 and used them as a cover for the riots, with the riots meaning to defund the police. They did succeed in defunding the police 15 million, even though they wanted a lot more. We watched our crime rate start to go up. We watched homicides start to go up. And then we began to hear more from Joanne, like we are less safe with the police. Policing, the way we do it today, does not work. And what it does is actually exacerbate a lot of social ills in our community. We have to acknowledge that we have squandered hundreds of millions of dollars into a public safety system that does not keep us safe. What I began to see was this, this thing that they were doing how I said was brainwashing people. And people were believing, yeah, we're less safe with the police because the police are just out to kill black men. The police are out to kill us. Look, let's make no mistakes about this. This is a mass delusion. The society is in the throes of a mass delusion. Shouldn't we be suspicious if ex nihilo from nothing comes a belief a moral system of value that has literally penetrated every single American institution almost overnight. No matter what the value is, shouldn't we be suspicious of it? Shouldn't we ask questions of it? And shouldn't we be even more suspicious of it if asking questions gets us in trouble? Of course we should. And if you do question it, you're a blasphemer, you're a heretic, you're a racist, you're a bigot, you're a Nazi, you're a sexist, you're a homophobe. Well, no, how about I'm just trying to figure out why you believe it? Like, what is your evidence for belief? If you had evidence, you wouldn't need to call anybody names. You'd just tell them why you believe it. And that's the other crazy thing about this ideology. There's no evidence for it. It's completely ideological. I think here in Portland, you know, Portland is a young city. You have a young, a lot of young people here. And a lot of them came here to sort of live out their progressive dreams, some of which are completely laudable. A lot of the young people here that have not been able to achieve what they felt were their laudable and achievable dreams, they need someone to blame for this. And they're angry. And so they're going to blame systemic racism and they're going to blame the police and they're going to blame the fact that they can't afford rents and they're going to blame the mayor. And they're extremely good right now at breaking stuff. I have yet to see evidence that they know how to build. And you know, if you're gonna have a working city, you gotta have things that are working, not just things that have been destroyed. They're telling me that the reason why that they're doing the damages is because that's the way that they get attention. That's the only way that they're going to be able to get on the news and be able to get attention to their particular issues. Property doesn't bleed, but I do. If ending systematic oppression means a store gets burnt or looted and nobody's hurt, how is that any worse than living in a situation where I have to fear for my life every day? You have a right to protest. You don't have a right to riot and destroy things. You don't have a right to attack people. And who are they to tell us uh, what to do and to attack people all in the name of social justice? The ideology is that you have to dismantle systems, you have to disrupt systems, and you have to disrupt the enforcement mechanism for those systems, which are their police. So if you take the police down, it'd be much easier to disrupt the systems. Prisons are something else that must be dismantled and disrupted, all of which they believe contributes to patriarchy and systemic racism. But the data just doesn't show that. I mean, if you look at the data, Nigerian Americans and Cuban Americans are among the most successful group of immigrants in the country. And that's the problem. If you look at the data, the woke people will tell you, well, data is just tools of, of white oppressors. We can't look to data. We, we have to look to lived experiences of people. But the problem is that that's the conclusion they start with and they reason backward from it. So if you start with that belief and reason backward, well, then of course you're going to find it. And that's what we see happening in the university. The president of Portland State University said that the highest priority of the university is racial justice. The highest priority. That's an astonishing statement. So how could the students who come out of there not be indoctrinated or inculcated with those values? 
that the system is inherently sexist, that the system is inherently racist. The radical left's idea that we have a corrupt system in need of dismantling has been at least partially subscribed to by a lot of people in Portland. Activists on social media pressure people to conform and adopt the woke worldview, and so many companies and institutions feel a need to signal their virtue in support of these ideas. Even grocery stores in Portland promulgate woke ideology. With everyone scrambling to appear as the most compassionate, the most anti-racist, and the most woke, it's no wonder we've transformed the city into a place where rioting is allowed and the police are treated with disdain. The fight for social justice has led many to turn a blind eye to the negative effects all this posturing has had on ordinary citizens, especially those who live downtown. I think we're about 100 some odd days, maybe 90 to 100 days into the riots. And being that I'm on 3rd and Jefferson, a block away from where this is taking place night after night after night, being a veteran, being uh, someone who spent a lot of time in war zones, active war zones, one particular evening, I counted at least 82 explosions. The feeling that really overcame me was feeling like I was in Mosul, Mosul, Iraq, with uh, nightly explosions. And, and we're talking, this went on for months. The feeling that I got inside was the same feeling, anxiety, rage, because I'm in Portland, I'm in my bed, and, I, and I'm hearing nothing but explosions. At some point, enough's enough. I mean, when you're hearing explosions uh, that shake your building, then it can be a little disheartening, especially to, to anyone that's been in a war zone and has gone through that and has, has experienced that. When you talk about smelling of, of gunpowder or explosions, along with hearing them, along with tear gas, it kind of hits all of your senses and makes things real. So of course, it's gonna bring things back uh, that you, you know, have, have dealt with. It was about 10 days into the riots and I went downstairs because I was exhausted. I was pissed off. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't watch Netflix. And all I wanted to do is try and tell these people, people live here. We pay rent here. You guys need to take this somewhere else, you know, or end this or do something. Well, I don't know who the hell I thought I was because, you know, there's probably, I don't know, three or four hundred of them out there. And of course, you know, no one's listening to me. And I've got, you know, people behind me and they're, they're grabbing newspaper machines and newspapers and they're starting fires all over the place. And I mean, it was just absolute chaos, absolute insanity. And this, this group of about six little young white girls walked by me and they looked at me and said, you don't matter. No lives matter until black lives matter. And I looked at her and she said, you're just a racist old white bitch and you're going to die soon anyway. Your life doesn't mean anything compared to what this movement means. When I talk to the rioters, what I get from them is they want to defund the police. They want to get rid of our local government. And then you ask them, well, what would happen if we got rid of the police? What happens when somebody gets raped? What happens when somebody gets burglarized? What happens when somebody gets killed? Who do you call? And the answers that I get back basically come out into more of a vigilante answer, which basically means they want chaos. They want the Wild West. They want anarchy. They don't want our way of life. The people who want to defund the police, that means, that means that we have to police ourselves. It was a fucking Nazi. Our community held its own and took out the trash. 
that Antifa member subsequently ended up losing his life in Washington. This was a person that was in and out of uh, the Multnomah County Jail. This is a person that the DA decided, well, hey, you know, you haven't done enough crime. We're going to let you go with the rest of the people. So there's a lot of responsibility that our local uh, government has uh, in, in creating this area of lawlessness. And I don't think he gets a free pass. I think that he's got, uh, you know, just as everybody else, blood on his hands. Even with the recent dramatic increase in shootings in Portland, she still supports decreasing the number of officers on the force. More police has never been the answer to solving gun violence. When we had a gang enforcement unit, we didn't stop gang activity. When we had a gun violence reduction team, we didn't stop guns from being on our street. One of the justifications that Joanne Hardesty had for getting rid of the gun violence reduction team was her belief that that group was a racist group because 50% of their investigations was being done inside of the black community, which here in Portland makes up about 6.6% of our populace. What she fails to talk about is the fact that the shootings and the homicides, about 68% of that is actually happening inside of that community. The gun violence reduction team basically curb gang violence. And so when you take that element off the street and allow criminals just to run wild, then you're gonna get what we see now. And we're seeing our homicides and uh, death rates um, back to and actually higher than uh, the levels they were in the 80s. The Oregonian just did an article on the faces of, of the homicides. And if you looked at all the faces that they posted, 65% of them are black and Mexican. So by disbanding GBRT, by taking officers off the street, by defunding, what we've done is actually hurt the communities that we said, hey, we're gonna go out and support, right? This is for you, this is what you want. When, hey, me as a Portlander, growing up and growing up and going through the 80s, I could see right off the bat, like what do you think is gonna happen to my community, the people that, that look like me? We can no longer afford to be taken in by positive sounding rhetoric and allow concern for signaling our virtues to be more important than carefully thinking through policies and actions that may have drastically negative effects on our cities and citizens. It's good to be concerned about minorities and the disenfranchised. And in order to do that, we need to pay close attention to what our city leaders have actually accomplished, what activist demands really are, and what certain policies actually result in, like what happens when the homeless are allowed to camp in and around the city. We've always had uh, a large homeless community, but I think that we've allowed it to grow beyond a level where one answer is gonna fix everything. A lot of these people that live out there are drug addicted and they don't want to live in a specialized community housing. Why? Because you can live on the street, they can build structures, and I say structures because now we're seeing them go beyond tents their long-term shelter. And that's what they're choosing to live. And that's what we allowed. The city is gonna have to roll up its sleeves and get a little ugly. We need to go and we need to tear these things down. People have to make a choice. Either you're going to choose to continue to live this life on the street. If you're going to do that, you don't get to do it here in the city of Portland. You can go somewhere else and do it. You can get yourself into a program or you can get in yourself into some of these city proposed housing projects but we need to do something. We can't allow them just to continue to take over our streets. We have city laws and ordinances that apply to all Portlanders, but normal citizens aren't making that choice just to, to live on the streets. And nothing is pretty when you have to clean up a problem. And until people are willing to stomach it, then we're gonna see ourselves you know, continue to stay in this place. A core part of woke ideology is the idea that victims are sacred and need to be venerated. It's often believed that what leads people to become homeless and to resort to violence is simply poverty, and that the homeless, destitute, and violent are nothing more than victims of an unjust system. But reality is a lot more complicated than that. 
being unable to look at the circumstances that have led people to become victims in the first place and offering help that is not contingent upon their own self-betterment is a form of pathological altruism, which is a concern for the well-being of others without paying attention to the unanticipated harm that often comes about as a result. These so-called victims have been permitted to break laws and get away with it, and to camp on the street and use drugs publicly because they are seen as incapable of helping themselves. And anyone who criticizes this is seen as someone who doesn't care about victims and those in need of help. This criticism from a vocal minority allows a small number of activists to control the narrative. And if you don't fall in line and agree wholeheartedly, you will very likely be ostracized and shamed. We have woke people right now who want everybody else to think exactly like they do. They want them to have their beliefs. And if you think about it in terms of cognitive liberty, then you can view that as a tyranny. Anybody can believe anything they want to believe. This to me is what makes this the shining city upon a hill. Anybody can come here, they can believe, they can take their traditions, or they cannot take their traditions. And the problem comes when other people impose their morality and their will and tell people what they can say or do or think. And that's the situation that we have now with the woke. They want to tell you what to think. They want to tell you how to live. They want to interfere in your friendships. This is the most un-American thing possible. And if you say that to them, they would laugh at that. They would say, yes, we hate this country. It's built on misogyny and racism. But these are the new authoritarians. This is the new tyranny. And the schism, the fault line in this is not conservative, liberal. It's not Republican, Democrat. The schism is those who are authoritarians and those who are not. Those who want liberty for everybody and those who do not. And now we have a bunch of totalitarian thugs like Antifa who wants to destroy that and destroy the institutions that protect our speech and our due process and our freedom of assembly and our freedom of the press. And we have those who stand against them. We have to recognize Antifa for who they are. This is not a local Portland problem. It's Portland, Seattle, Minneapolis, Chicago, New York, San Francisco, LA, you name it. Most of the major cities have some elements of Antifa. This is a national problem. So first we have to be able to look at it as a national problem and recognize that our FBI and our federal resources are needed, similar to the resources that are being employed against the Capitol rioters from January 6th. That level of resources are needed in order for us to seriously address this problem. The rioting isn't, isn't over yet. It's probably going to come, you know, back to a head when we start to get into the spring and the summertime. Hopefully we won't see the battles between Antifa and Proud Boys and other groups that are out there and that we'll be in a position to where the police have a good understanding on what direction we're going to go and how we're going to actually curb the tide. But the main thing that the city really needs to get a handle on right now is uh, the gun violence, the gangs and, and the shootings, because it is out of control. As we get a handle on that, uh, we'll be able to deal with some of these other problems like uh, the rioting. But it really t you know, takes people to stand up and say enough's enough and we don't support you. Until we, ch we start to see how our vote is affecting what's happening and we decide we're going to change how we vote. We're not going to get people who can go in there and have what it takes to say, okay, enough, and let's start making some changes to restore law and order, to restore some sanity, and start to restore Portland back to what she was. One of the first things we need to do is we need to vote out Joanne Hardesty. I believe that she has done a lot of destruction with the police. She's been a focal point on defunding the police and has done a lot of damage to our city. I think next is, is we have to address our district attorney, Mike Schmidt, who has let go the vast majority of those that are arrested during these riots. Policing isn't always pretty, and I, and I think that we have to understand that. And I think that we live in an age where we're not just gonna target a race, but what we should do is target groups, as in gangs, and we have a rise in gun violence, we have a rise in deaths, we have a rise in drug use, and I think that all of those things perpetuate the situation that we find ourselves in. I think that 
that we as Portlanders have to understand that it's gonna get ugly before it gets better and we have to have a stomach for it. We need people across our city and across our nation to be walking up to police officers and thanking them for their job. It's important that police officers are proud about what they are doing and that they are supported by their local government, but they also need to feel supported by their community. And the best thing we can do is to be able to thank them and show them the appreciation that they rightly deserve. One of the things to be able to keep in mind is we have over 700,000 police officers across the nation. The odds are just by large numbers that there are going to be some people inside of that organization that shouldn't be there and should ultimately be filtered out. So there needs to be a good process for evaluating the performance of police officers and ultimately being able to pull those out that don't meet our standards. Rather than advocating for police reform, which every reasonable person wants, woke activists advocated for and succeeded in defunding the police in Portland and many other cities with devastating effects, even though most black Americans never wanted to defund the police in the first place. The price of nice sounding platitudes and rhetoric has been blood in the streets and the accelerated decay of once functioning cities. Portland has been demoted from one of the most attractive tourist locations to one of the least desirable cities to visit. Many residents who lived through the riots of 2020 and the subsequent increase in violence have moved away and many businesses, especially downtown, have closed for good. It's time to pay closer attention to the consequences of the terrible ideas found in woke ideology. And we need to stop kowtowing to an ideology that openly wants to destroy the liberal values most of us share. The time to be complacent and to assume that someone else will fix the problems we face is over. We must focus on solutions. The first thing we can do is, as unsexy of an answer it is, is you can just show up. You can literally just show up. You can show up to your PTA meetings. You can show up to your school board meetings. You can show up if you're a stockholder. For anything that you can show up for, you should show up for. Because what happens over and over again is a small hyper vocal group of activists show up and they hijack the agenda. Second thing you can do is you can document, literally document videos. You can take pictures. You can save documents. You can upload those and then subsequently you can make videos about those, you can talk about those, you can communicate what's happening. One of the most important things that we need to do, however, before any of that is the case, is we have to embolden people to be able to speak out. And we need to make it completely acceptable to ask questions because right now we're in an age of heresy. You can't ask questions about certain things and it should always be acceptable in a democracy to be able to ask questions. Don't be afraid. Gosh, I've spoken to so many people here who are just literally like locking themselves in their house because they're afraid to say the wrong thing. Well, who's deciding what's the wrong thing? You know, speak your conscience, speak your mind, talk to your neighbors. Don't be intimidated. That's what people want. They want you to be intimidated. This is what every, every movement that wants to control something, they use intimidation. Don't be intimidated. Stand up, take the consequences, take the heat. And don't think that by spouting leftist platitudes, they won't come for you. They're gonna come for you even more. So don't be a coward, just stand up. The Greeks call it parahesia, speaking truth in the face of danger. That's what we need now more than anything. That's the only thing that's gonna get us out of this. Parahesia, speaking truth in the face of danger.